आपने भी अभी भी ज्वाइन नहीं किया ज्वाइन किया है जी सो नाइस है गुड मॉर्निंग ऑन अभी हाँ ऑन कर ऑन कर दिया साहब हाँ हाँ लेकिन आप जुड़ नहीं रहे मेरे आवाज सुनाई दे रहा है मेरे आपका तो नहीं आ रहा है हाँ बोलिए बोलिए हेलो नहीं आपका थोड़ा सा देख लीजिए म्यूट फूट होगा कहीं ठीक है सर अब आ रही है आवाज हाँ बस बस ठीक ठीक है है और सर थैंक यू फाइन
हाँ गुड मॉर्निंग सर ऑफिस आ गया ना रास्ता में है साहब जोड़ी जाइए क्या इलेवन ओ क्लॉक ठीक है सर ओके ओके सर गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग सर गुड मॉर्निंग
गुड मॉर्निंग हलदर साहब गुड मॉर्निंग राव साहब एंड गुड मॉर्निंग डॉक्टर दत्ता हाय गुड मॉर्निंग बॉस हाउ आर यू या फाइन फाइन नाइस टू मीट या सेम सेम हियर या थैंक यू इन फैक्ट आई एम प्लीज दैट यू आर गोइंग टू स्पीक बिफोर आई विल स्पीक ओ आई सी दैट विल टेक केयर ऑफ लॉट मेनी थिंग्स यू नो Oh, I hope so. <laughs> But sorry, I'm sorry for the last minute change. Yeah. Oh ho! Oh, come on, I'm sitting at home. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See, I retired 15 years back. So, oh, I see. गुड मॉर्निंग सुया साहब गुड मॉर्निंग हलदर साहब सो नाउ वी कैन स्टार्ट बिकॉज देर इज लिटिल हरी फॉर डॉक्टर पी सी राव सो हील बी बिजी आफ्टर दिस लेक्चर फॉर देयर इज ओन एक्टिविटी इन साइंस डे टूडे नाउ सर वी स्टार्ट राइट नाउ सर या प्लीज प्लीज ओके सर गुड मॉर्निंग प्रोफेसर सूर्य प्रकाश गुड मॉर्निंग सर हाउ आर यू फाइन फाइन थैंक यू Good morning, everybody. Namaskar. Now, in the series of webinar today, we'll be con uh, conducting that webinar from uh, in the topic earthquake precursor detection in the Indian context. So, in this uh, series, there will be two speaker, and Professor H N Dutta, uh, and Dr. Purn Puran Chandra. Now. due to uh, <clears throat> certain things that we have uh, we'll be starting the lecture with dr puran chandra rao chief scientist ngri now before that i would say a uh, few words about the introduction and welcome so i heart felt and as well as i uh, welcome from my core of heart to all those distinguished speaker and our head professor shilapaka sir and all the panelist and as well as the participants who has joined quite a long back and it is a pleasure to us that we'll be having the good uh, participant right now a uh, uh, good amount of participant has joined now we will uh, still wait uh, still we are expecting some more participant will come now we know in the context the earthquake it is a very devastating phenomena due to sudden movement or tumbling of the earth due to the inside that is the core from core certain uh, uh, instantly some energy used to release and that will give the jerk in the surface of the earth and also due to the movement of tectonic plates that also creates shakes in the ground and causes earthquake as well as tsunami is also very uh, common phenomena not obviously all the times but it is a great devastation due to the sudden release of energy from the inner core of earth and this seismology is it study about the cause and repeat type size of earthquake and earthquakes are measured using watching from seismogram now the seismogram is a record of ground motions caused by seismic waves from the earthquake a seismograph or seismometer is the measuring instrument that causes seismogram almost all seismometer are based on the principle of inertia that is where a suspended mass tends to remain still when the ground moves so <clears throat> very few words i'll uh, i'll say 
in uh, keeping in view the time constant, earthquake prediction is a popular topic among the scientists. However, this task is challenging and exhibits uncertainty. Therefore, probability assessment of indispensable in the current period. During the last decade, the volume of seismic data has increased exponentially, adding scalability issues to probability assessment model. Several machine learning methods, such as deep learning, have been applied in the large scale images. Video, text processing, however, there have been rarely utilized in earthquake probability assessment. Therefore, it is need of research leveraged advanced in deep learning techniques to generate scalable earthquake probability mapping. Also, a lot of work is going on in the India's leading uh, organization, NGRI and other organizations they are doing. And also that among the pet animals, that is dog, bar, they'll be sensed before this type of events. Even the uh, animals are able to detect the fast why animals have been seen snapping to attention, acting confused, running right before the ground starts to shake. They used to graze. And even the dogs, they are having very much sensitivity for smell and hearing. And they can they have the heightened sense of what I am telling smell and hearing. With their heightened sense, they can tell when there's a change in barometric pressure, which changes with different weather patterns. Dogs know when the pressure is changing because scent will either travel faster or slower with the changing pressure. Now, as for the dog owners, the key factors reported by the owners who have witnessed their dogs acting out of the ordinary, uh, out of the ordinary before the earthquake is simply taking place. And abnormal changes behavior in their pets. This could be an average in dogs uh, community, activity levels, heightened anxiety, barking, whining, and even trying to escape or leave. So these are the certain things that they also sense and they have to give the symbol before the disaster. Now, I'll not go further before our eminent speakers are there. They'll speak a lot about this, I expect. Now, before hand over to the speaker, I would request our Professor Shurya Prakashab to put a keynote address uh, in this issue. Now, I'll introduce this uh, Dr. Uh, Just one second. I think it is visible, sir. This is your slide. Yes, yes. Yes, okay. Now, Professor Surya Pokas, he is presently working in this NIDM, National Institute of Disaster Man Management, as head in GMR division. He is a nodal officer for coordinating with central ministries, departments of disaster risk management related planning research and capacity building for Ministry of Mines, Ministry of Coal, Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas, Ministry of Communication, Ministry of Shipping, Ministry and Department of Northeastern State, Parliamentary Affairs, News and Renewable, Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, Labor, Employment and National Postal, Postal Academy. He is the faculty in charge in six specialized center, that is early warning and communication, hill area development, coastal DRR and R, CBRN, industrial DRR and cyber DRR. He is also team leader in world center of excellence in landslide and disaster reduction from 2011 to 14, again, 2020 to 2023. He is also supervisor in charge of flood monitoring cell and emergency, emergency operation center. With this introduction, I would request Professor Suryapukas to take the stage and put his keynote address. Professor Suryapukas, sir, please. Uh, good morning uh, to all. 
and uh, thank you dr haldar sir uh, for uh, providing me this opportunity to speak in the inaugural program earthquakes as most of us know are very important hazards in terms of their widespread impacts as well as uh, the current state of our non predictability particularly in terms of temporal framework and also the level of uh, unpreparedness in terms of earthquake resistant structures and infrastructures lot of earthquakes have happened in the recent past i can recall from the historical periods we have been talking much about uh, uttarakhand which suffered uh, earthquakes way back in 1803 and then uh, 1819 gujarat earthquake 1897 the shillong earthquake 1905 kangra earthquake 1934 bihar nepal earthquake 1950 assam earthquake which happened on our, our independence day and then uh, the recent ones uh, i can recall from 1919 since i have been involved with the earthquake which happened on 20th october early morning in the uttarakashi district of uttarakhand state followed by another earthquake which took place in 1993 in uh, latur and then 95 we have earthquake in uh, himachal and 97 i remember jabalpur 99 again we had an earthquake in chamoli and 2001 26 january our republic day we had an earthquake in uh, gujarat kach area followed by another earthquake uh, which took place in the indian ocean swami leading to the uh, no major uh, disaster of uh, loss of thousands of lives around the coast of the indian ocean affecting more than almost 11 countries then uh, followed by another earthquake which happened in kashmir i think it was 8th or 10th of october 2005 and then uh, we had an earthquake in manipur in 2016 uh, uh, sorry uh, 2006 and then uh, there were earthquakes uh, which had happened uh, in uh, nepal 2015 earthquake also Uh, which happened in april and uh, followed by another earthquake in may 25th april and 12th of may and so on. there were uh, another major earthquake i should make a mention of that which is important for us uh, that earthquake which happened on 18th september 2011 in sikkim all these earthquakes which are actually happening in the uh, himalayan territories they are not only just causing damages because of the structural uh, damage or loss or destructions but also leading to landslides earthquake triggered or induced landslides which are actually blocking our operations during the disaster times i remember when the sikkim earthquake took place we were actually hurdled by the road uh, blockades due to landslides that happened co simultaneously with the earthquake at that time similar uh, observations were also there during the uttarakashi earthquake and the chamoli earthquake as well as during the kashmir earthquake so when we are dealing with the earthquakes we have a multi hazard perspective and we need to know not only uh, the structural damages to the buildings to the highways to the infrastructure utilities services but also the consequences of earthquake related landslides do they also need uh, attention then the second point uh, which uh, we are more interested is in terms of undersea earthquakes which are leading to tsunami government of india after the occurrence of the 26 december 2004 indian ocean tsunami actually established uh, and dedicated institute in quais for uh, no studying uh, these earthquakes induced land uh, tsunami and uh, they are also uh, issuing early warning in that perspective which is quite comparable to the pacific tsunami warning center which was one of the renowned centers prior to 2004 tsunami who issued uh, the early warning related to that event so in, but in our cases uh, in the recent times whatever uh, undersea earthquake happened uh, the related 
a tsunami warning were also issued by the inquest, which were found to be quite credible and reliable in terms of their forecast and modeling. So these are some of these issues uh, which are of importance to us as earthquakes have been striking us. I just mentioned you some of those examples which are indicating almost uh, an earthquake of magnitude more than six on a biannual basis. Almost every two years I can count on an earthquake uh, that has happened in or around our country. And uh, the, these studies are very important. I remember way back in 76 when Chinese actually tried to uh, infer an earthquake based on multi-parametric studies, biogeophysical uh, parameter studies, which actually uh, led to a correct forecast in the one of the earthquakes. And but the subsequent earthquake in the next year could not be predicted by them. So there are still uh, some uncertainties certain limitations in our understanding of the earthquakes. Now we know the uh, related uh, tectonic features or structural features uh, which are leading to this geodynamic phenomena and uh, we can map those features, but still there are many hidden features which are subsurface and not easily detectable can also lead to earthquakes uh, with uh, unexpected locations. So, or unexpected magnitudes. However, the current studies which have taken place in terms of uh, the active, active tectonic mapping actually also helped us understanding the object locations in terms of spatial predictions for the earthquakes, as well as the instrumental uh, technologies which have developed, been developed recently have actually uh, given us some time slot or time lag for the earthquake early warning as well. But that's not good enough for humans to act. However, the automated systems, they can depend on that uh, early warning, which is only for a few seconds to a minute, uh, only helps in the automated uh, infrastructure systems. But uh, on, people need to be prepared against that. We need to prepare, uh, go for mitigation. In terms of uh, the earth follow-up of uh, earthquake resistant features in our all constructions and developments, as well as retrofitting and re-strengthening of the existing structures and uh, infrastructure to reduce the risks and enhance resilience of our infrastructure, as well as the human beings through adequate information, awareness and preparedness uh, with the involvement of uh, experienced scientists that we are involving today. For example, Dr. Puran Chandraoji and uh, Dr. H. N. Dadaji are both are very known figures in this field. And uh, Dadaji has our, will be also talking about the precursors and potential early warning systems. And also, they will be discussing about the detection of earthquakes in Indian context. So I wish them all the best for their uh, lecture because they, uh, there will be more details uh, about uh, this program from their side. And uh, I thank them uh, for joining with us and sharing their rich knowledge, ideas, experiences, and informations, as well as innovations in this field. Uh, I would urge all the participants to kindly do ask questions to them to gain requisite knowledge that is needed by you and how can we actually deal with such disasters which are still not uh, well predictable and uh, we need to prepare against that we cannot avoid we cannot prevent the occurrences of earthquakes so therefore we need to uh, know enhance our awareness information and preparedness against them as well as mitigate uh, the impacts of these uh, disasters through appropriate uh, interventions in terms of retrofitting, re-strengthening and earthquake resistant features in workers' stru uh, structures and infrastructures. So I wish them all the best and uh, thank you very much for this. Wish you all a safe, healthy and good quality life on an equitable, justifiable and right-based manner with good fraternity. Thank you very much, Alda Saab. Back to you. Thank you, sir.
definitely your words are right that we cannot prevent the earthquake first thing second thing we can we should motivate the people for the preparation and also we should put force for the mitigation and rehabilitation that is all the things are true now next i would request in this uh, in this uh, continuation of the lecture after this keynote address that uh, dr puran chand rao chief scientist ngri national geophysical research institute that is the csir hyderabad based and he will put his lecture on earthquake prediction forecast and early warning and and current status we know that uh, dr puran chand rao he is a he is a chief scientist from ngri and he is uh, quite a long time he is working there and basically he is eminent speaker on earthquake dr rao is a well known seismologist seismologist with over 3 decades of research experience and having worked in india and abroad currently he is working as chief scientist and ac sir professor at the csir ngri ngri and uh, a premier research lab in the country where he heads newly formed group of environmental seismology earlier he worked for 3 years as a director of national center for earth science studies tirvandram under the ministry of earth science government of india where he seeded several new research program and activities dr rao he has his masters and phd in geophysics from osmania university hyderabad and also a dsc degree in seismology from the university of tokyo japan dr rao specializes in seismic wave form modeling for earthquake resource mechanism as well as earth's internal structure his current interest include environmental seismology ambient seismic noise tomography and reservoir trigger seismicity he was involved in global seismic hazard assessment program of the indian region and was the principal investigator from ngri for the first seismic micro generation project of the country in jabalpur central india he has led several important research projects including seismic deep learning program in the koina region a prestigious flagship program of ministry of earth science government of india in his in its initial stage dr rao has worked extensively on the seismotectonics of the indian plate region based on focal mechanism and stress modeling studies his work has provided several new models in the indian plate tectonics the modern uh, the most significant one being the explanation of cessation of subduction of burmese arc region a result that appeared on the cover page of the geophysical research letters in 2005 he was first to propose a unique pop up uplift mechanism of the silang plateau in 1997 Dr Rao he is uh, in his credential he is having more than 100 published paper reports book chapters he has traveled widely in uh, in global are a visiting scientist over 20 countries he has guided and presently guiding also more than 12 phd students including a foreign student from vietnam his latest work on seismic monitoring and early warning with reference to Second February, and that is seventh February, two thousand twenty-one. Uttarakhand disaster was recently published in a prestigious journal, Science Journal. Dr. Rao was the first recipient of NGC AG PhD thesis award when it was instituted in nineteen ninety-seven. He is also recipient of the prestigious Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship in Germany. he was jsps fellow at the earthquake research institute university of tokyo during 1995 to 2000 later he was a visiting professor at the university of tokyo 
Japan in 2008, a Roman research fellow at the University of California, San Diego, USA. He is a recipient of NGRI, a National Geoscience Award 2016 from the Ministry of Mines, Government of India. He is the fellow of Geological Society of India, a fellow of both Andhra Pradesh and Telangana Academic Science. He is member of several important committees, Bureau of Standards, Government of India, and Department of Atomic Energy Committees for Tsunami Studies. He was an associate editor of the journal Earth Science, Earth System Science, editorial board member of journal Asian Earth Sciences, and editorial board of advisory member of Indian Journal of Earth Sciences. He was guest editor for several special issues and reviewer for top journals in Earth Science. Additionally, Dr. Rao has been spokesperson and social media handler in CSIR in GRI, dealing with the press and media for several years. Now, in this, this science day, he is having this Roman fellowship also. It is very appropriate that we got also Dr. Rao to have put his uh, lecture on the topic that is the earthquake prediction for forecast and early warning and current status. With this, I will hand over the stage to Dr. Rao or to take up the stage and please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Haldar, for your very kind words. Uh... Professor Datta, Professor Surya Prakash, and uh, very distinguished scientists and students who must be attending this talk. May I load my presentation? Uh, just one second, please. Okay. Yes, you are visible and yeah. All right. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So I have been working as a seismologist for more than 30 years now. And during most of my lectures, the, the most standard question that was asked was, can earthquakes be predicted? I'm sure you will all agree. And unfortunately, the answer is no. So we start off with a very sorry face saying that uh, it is not possible. But then we, we also need to understand, apart from this, what else is possible, because uh, it's not just about prediction, yes or no. There are so many other responsibilities that we have, uh, which were outlined uh, by Professor Surya Prakash uh, a little while ago. So in this talk, I will, uh, I would like to um, try to bring in the perspective what prediction means and what forecast means, what early warning means, what we can do and what we cannot do. And I'll give you some examples so that will highlight uh, where we stand. I think it's very important to understand all these uh, elements so that we know where which way we are going. So the topics that I'll uh, briefly touch upon will be the a few little basics of earthquakes in case there are uh, non-specialists. Then I'll deal with earthquake hazard, earthquake engineering, earthquake prediction, earthquake forecast, and finally earthquake early warning. So let us uh, quickly see what these all mean and uh, where we stand. Now, this is a basic definition of earthquake. As you all know, that it's basically a block movement, the shaking or trembling caused by sudden release of energy. And this is associated with faulting, which is a block movement. It's very important to understand that this is distinct from a new, an explosion. So an explosion, the energy goes radially out. So it's a, it's, a, it's a circular transmission of energy. Whereas in an earthquake, it is a block movement along a line or along a fault. Now, this is an example of a strike slip type of earthquake where uh, the, as long as the stress can be resisted by the medium it resists and once the critical limit is reached then it breaks so this very clearly explains how an earthquake occurs now this is the indian region and you can see the last 50 years of earthquakes have been plotted in this diagram and uh, this very clearly shows which are the hazardous regions the himalaya the burma andaman Arc. These are the most hazard, hazardous regions. You also have earthquakes in the Indian Ocean region, which are smaller in magnitude, and uh, some within the continent, which are called intraplate earthquakes. Now, coming to the Himalaya, we have seen the greatest earthquakes, at least four we have seen the 1905 Kangra, 
the 1897 Shillong earthquake, the 1934 Bihar Nepal earthquake, and the 1950 Assam earthquake. So ever since we have not seen a, any earthquake in the Himalaya, and therefore it is uh, anticipated that another great earthquake is already overdue. And which region is most likely to have this great earthquake? It's uh, uh, rather obvious because you have a huge seismic gap over here. So it is believed by experts that another great earthquake is round the corner in this region. And you also know that in 2015, there was an earthquake in Nepal, which killed several people. But unfortunately, it turned out that this was not the gap filling earthquake. So it was just like a precursor or it was just like a teaser, I would say. I'm sorry to say that. So which means that the hazard very much exists and there is an anticipated great earthquake in this gap region. Now, in, in, the, in, in the face of this situation where we have to face great earthquakes in future, what are the approaches that seismologists generally take? So, as you all know, earthquake hazard assessment is a very important thing so that we are aware of how much of hazard we can expect in different parts of the country or at different uh, seismic uh, zones. So, there are two approaches, deterministic and probabilistic. So, determ deterministic is basically a forward computation where we assume all the values and we do a forward calculation of how much hazard we can expect at a region. The other uh, more um, uh, popular approach is the probabilistic approach, which is based on all the past data. So it's basically an assessment of the existing seismic, seismotectonic data of the region. So the process involves identifying all the seismotectonic zones making a, a history or a catalog of the seismicity from the past. So, you know, past represents the future. So, if we study the past carefully and see what kind of seismicity happened in a place, then it gives a clue to what can be expected in future. And then you have various other things. Uh, these are all technical aspects where uh, you need to develop the B value for the region. I'll come to that. Then the minimum and maximum magnitude, what, what are the expected source locations and focal depths and what is the attenuation law? That means how the energy attenuates as the seismic waves propagate and what would be the probability or recurrence of an earthquake. That means the larger earthquakes occur less frequently. So what would be the return time, return period for uh, such big earthquakes? So these are all the aspects that are required to be analyzed in order to compute a probability, a probabilistic hazard assessment map. So this is an example of how the seismic zones can be delineated based on their characteristics. And of course, there are various other things like you have to uh, def from a defined site, what is the distance to each of these fault or the seismic zones we need to calculate. And then we have to see the magnitude rate, uh, the, the, uh, the re recurrence rate. That means uh, uh, this is also called the Gutenberg-Richter relation, and uh, which means uh, with increasing magnitude, how the number of earthquakes increases. The slope of this curve is an important parameter called the B value, which goes into the calculation. And then you have to also see the, the, uh, the attenuation, how it is happening with distance. So this varies from place to place, depending on the structure of the earth in that area. And uh, finally, you need to calculate what is the probability that a certain level of acceleration will increase. So we, say we, say we define a level of acceleration for a certain region, which we can tolerate. And then we calculate what is the probability that this level will be exceeded. So these are some of the technical aspects of calculating probabilistic seismic hazard assessment and a lot of work is going on in this uh, direction. So this is an example of GSHAP, which is the Global Seismic Hazard Assessment Program, where we try to calculate the peak ground acceleration that can be expected in different regions. And as you can see, the red and the orange uh, zones are the uh, having the highest acceleration values and then comes the yellow and the green uh, regions, that is the Himalaya and Northeast India. And if you go to a finer scale, when you take up a particular city or a town and do a very detailed study, very detailed analysis of the seismic hazard and the risk, that is called microzonation. And this, I'm showing you an example of the very first study done in the country in the 1990s for the city of Jabalpur. So you can see the different hazard levels that have been delineated for the city. And basically, we need to understand that seismic hazard is just a computation of what might happen due to an earthquake. But at the end of the day, it's very important to know what is the seismic risk to the mankind. 
So to calculate that, we need to get into vulnerability and the product of seismic hazard and vulnerability gives you the seismic risk of that region. So seismic risk directly relates to the public, the population, the, the dwellings and so on. So, because if you have a big earthquake in uh, somewhere in the middle of the ocean, it is not very risky. So, that is the meaning. Now, in spite of all these things, earthquakes keep happening and you have serious damages. This is an example of the Kashmir earthquake of 2005. And you can see that even though magnitude was below 8, the destruction was enormous and uh, more than 30,000 people were killed. So, this essentially is because the buildings are very poorly constructed. So, one very important uh, take home here is, that uh, earthquakes don't kill, the buildings do. So, very important to construct proper buildings with the proper codes that have been prescribed. Very, very important. So, for every citizen, whether earthquake can be predicted or not, the buildings we should construct in such a way that uh, we can uh, uh, withstand any earthquake that is likely to happen in that region. Now, what is the main reason for the buildings collapsing? The main reason is that the most of the civil engineering uh, uh, the, the designs, they take care of the vertical loads and uh, not really the horizontal loads. And whereas the surface waves, they travel horizontally from side to side. And this is precisely why the buildings collapse. So there are a lot of designs uh, which come under earthquake engineering, which help to hold the building even if there are forces from the sides. So you can see this in this picture, you have this uh, uh, the brackets which are in the shape of X. So these are helpful in holding the square. Otherwise, it will deform and become a rhombus. So as long as the building stays like a square, it is safe. Otherwise, it gets deformed and it collapses. So these are some more examples of earthquake resistant buildings. Uh, so this is by itself an important subject where you keep uh, construct buildings which are safe. Now, this is an example of the world's tallest bridge in France, which was made uh, earthquake resistant with the same uh, concept. Now, even in poor countries, which cannot afford expensive technology, it is possible to have earthquake resistant buildings. So, here you see an example where using bamboos and nails, it is possible to build a mesh like this, which is directly nailed into the hut. So, this is not a cement uh, construction. Uh, very, so, it's very weak and in the in case of an earthquake, it will not withstand. So, this kind of simple techniques can also help to withstand uh, any major earthquake. This is from Nepal. In Nepal, for example, uh, they, they use this kind of uh, protection. Now, in the richer countries, they can afford what is called the base isolation technology. So, here what happens is the base is not fixed to the ground, but you construct the base of the building in such a way that whenever there is an earthquake, the building oscillates to the sides because of detachment from these bases and therefore it does not collapse. So this is a very useful technology, but also it's very expensive. In countries like Japan have adopted this immensely. Now, we need to understand the difference between what is earthquake prediction and what is earthquake forecast. So prediction is a more specific thing where the date, time, location, and magnitude has to be specified. So, otherwise, if you say there is going to be an earthquake in Himalaya, it doesn't make sense because uh, smaller earthquakes, they happen in Himalaya almost every day if you go to the very small magnitudes. So, a prediction has to specify the magnitude also in addition to the location and at what time it is going to happen. So, this as on date is an impossible thing, although people have tried and uh, um, uh, several people have claimed that they can predict, but let us understand that there is no reliable, uh, dependable method as on date. Now, what is a forecast? Forecast is a slightly lenient uh, thing compared to prediction. So, forecast is basically where you observe a region, monitor a region for a long time, and you find various precursory changes, and then you forecast that the region is developing stress, and it's very likely that there's going to be an earthquake, so maybe in the next few weeks or maybe in the next few months. So that sort of, um, it's, uh, it's sometimes confused with prediction, but this is uh, more appropriately called a forecast. And I will show you some examples of uh, forecast that we were able to do in the Koina region of Maharashtra. Now, uh, the earthquake precursory signal, there are several signals because before an earthquake, you find a lot of changes. Uh, for example, foreshock nucleation pattern. That means the earthquake foreshocks 
uh, suddenly it's increase in some areas and then there is a quiescence before a major earthquake happens. This has been reported from various places. And then there is a change in the ratio of P wave and S wave velocity in that region or you have emission of gases. So, this is possible if the region is stressed and somewhere already fractured, it is possible that gases from within can escape and come on to the surface. Then you have electromagnetic anomalies. I will show you some examples later on. And then water level changes. For example, if there is a squeezing of a region, uh, the water, uh, for example, if you are monitoring a, uh, some boreholes, you will find that the, suddenly the level is uh, increasing or decreasing depending on some tectonic uh, squeeze or force. And lastly, we have animal behavior. There's been a lot of research on animal behavior. Several animals seem to be sensitive. But unfortunately, we could not uh, utilize any of these because they are not uh, very reliable and they keep changing from time to time. So, it's very hard to depend on behavior of animals to make a prediction uh, of earthquakes. So, so, these studies are still going on. All these uh, precursors have been uh, studied and are, are also being studied right now. But we have still not reached a concrete stage where we can uh, forecast or predict earthquakes uh, very confidently. Now, let's look at the past, whether there have been some successful predictions. In 1975, in Haicheng, China, a magnitude 7.3 earthquake was predicted and it came true. And since all the, since it is in China and they could manage to convince all the people to evacuate. So, it was regarded as a very successful prediction. But the very next year in Tangshan, there was a 7.7 earthquake and 6.5 lakh people died. And there was absolutely no clue that this earthquake is going to come. So, this raises questions whether we are really very clear on the methodology or is it more of a fluke, some kind of a fluke that we could manage to predict. Anyway, subsequently, some predictions have come out true. You had one in Mexico, one in Japan and one in California. Uh, these earthquakes have apparently been predicted. But again, the same problem, the methodology is not very clear. So, we cannot claim that yes, earthquakes can be predicted. It's not like that. Now, I'll give you a few examples of uh, precursors that were monitored in the Koina region. Uh, I was the project leader uh, for about almost about 10 years. We worked in Koina region where we have an excellent network of seismographs which are monitored in real time. So, we get data in real time to NGRA Hyderabad. Uh, I'll not go too much into the details except that Koina is the world's uh, number one site of reservoir triggered seismicity and that's the reason why we have been studying these earthquakes here. Now, I'll show you some uh, uh, data which shows uh, clear-cut precursory changes before an earthquake. So, a precursory study was done using various aspects, not just seismology. We also try to monitor the gravity field, we monitored the electromagnetic field, we monitored the GPS, we monitored the water level changes, we monitored the hydrochemistry and so on. So many things we try to monitor in order to see if uh, there can be changes noticed before earthquakes. So, I'll just show you some examples. Now, you can see these are the different boreholes and prior to an earthquake of magnitude 4.2 in May 2006, we could see a drastic drop in the water level. See, there are four uh, wells, bore wells, and in all the four, we could see a very drastic drop in the water level. And this usually happens if there's a tectonic stress a squeeze on the medium but uh, it's important that you should monitor this in real time so that you can uh, in in real time if you don't do it then you miss the signal so a real time monitoring will help us to make a forecast that an earthquake is going to happen similarly hydrochemical changes this is really very convincing because not just one uh, chemical but various like you have the chloride sulfate and fluoride and you have also have the oxygen isotope that uh, the, the, con the content of the chemical concentration, it changes uh, over a period of time. And what is interesting, we find that between two earthquakes of magnitude 5 that occurred in Koina, we could find that uh, the, there is a sudden drop in this. For example, if you take the O18, there is a sudden drop prior to the earthquake and then there is a rise after the earthquake. And if you uh, take the chloride, for example, there is a rise and then there is a drop. So, the anomaly is very clear for uh, whichever uh, component you take. And uh, the, using this data, this, this earthquake was predicted, uh, which uh, occurred in uh, 2009. This earthquake was predicted, or rather, I would say forecasted. Similarly, we find that there is a lowering of the B value. Uh, you, you can see these blue colored numbers. 
you will find that the b value is lowest just uh, prior to or maybe exactly during the occurrence of earthquakes so we found almost 70% coincidence with the lowering of b value uh, during an earthquake occurrence similarly we found this nucleation was a very successful thing the clustering of earthquakes prior to a few days before the occurrence of a larger earthquake so in koina large earthquake means 4 or 5 magnitude because uh, it's not a plate a tectonic uh, plate boundary so please uh, bear with that and similarly so this is the list of earthquakes that were forecasted at least four earthquakes we are we were able to forecast well in advance and this was published uh, before occurrence of the earthquakes similarly i'll show you some other examples from uh, outside uh, india also we it's found that there are variations of the vertical electric field in the atmosphere few days before this is for the kamchatka earthquake you can see here that the electrical field there is a sudden change now i'll also explain why these things happen now for example this is the total electron content in the ionosphere so it is found that in the region of the earthquake suddenly the tec changes a few days before the occurrence of earthquake so now a lot of people are working on this one so there are a lot of theories as to how this happens and um, one of them is that the uh, earth when it gets stressed before an earthquake so it also uh, behaves like a piezoelectric uh, substance that uh, generates an electric field of its own and this goes and interacts with the ionosphere where the tec suddenly changes so you can see here three days prior how the tec is gradually changing over this uh, this white plus is the earthquake location in greece so the, the change is very very clear just before the occurrence of earthquake so three days prior this kind of thing was observed here also you can see as a function of date that uh, before the 6.1 earthquake and the 6 earthquake the tc count has suddenly changed here and here also but then you will find that for this first earthquake the change is less for the second one it is more so these are some of the challenges every time you don't get similar results so how you are going to rely upon these observations to make any forecast that is the biggest challenge that we face today now earthquake war early warning is a possibility and the countries like japan and mexico are already you you utilizing this so here the concept is that since the p wave arrives first because p wave travels with uh, about 6 km per second velocity compared to the surface waves which are uh, less than 3.5 uh, km per second so before surface waves arrive the p wave arrives uh, several seconds before so if in real time you can automatically analyze the p wave and then find uh, find out that the earthquake is approaching then you have something like 5 or 10 seconds time depending on the region so these few seconds of uh, warning sometimes even that can be very useful for example if you have a super fast uh, train uh, that is uh, tra traveling at a very high speed so at least the driver will have time to apply brakes and bring the train to halt so that the damage is reduced or if some uh, nuclear power plant has to be shut down or if there's some major surgery going on in some hospital so things like that so this, this is not uh, uh, extreme it's not extremely useful but nevertheless it is useful provided we have the technology and we implement it properly so in summary i would like to say that the earthquake prediction current status it's not possible earthquake forecast the current status is it is possible but is very challenging earthquake early warning also is possible but very challenging now these two challenges are different that's an interesting thing to notice that the challenge in earthquake forecast is different from the challenge in early warning in forecast the biggest challenge is to find consistent precursors precursors which do not uh, i mean which behave in the same fashion every time so so that we can rely upon otherwise there will be false alarms we'll issue a forecast and then it doesn't happen so the biggest problem is if you go on uh, making false uh, alarms then uh, people don't trust you so the next time even if you make a correct prediction people will not believe that's the challenge there and in earthquake early warning the biggest challenge is uh, to have the best technology so that you have a maximum possible warning time and the second challenge is to educate people and to interact with the stakeholders about how we can utilize this very limited time in order to uh, you know protect ourselves from the earthquake so very small time is available during early warning how to utilize that one success story in the country was uh, i think uh, csio uh, chandigarh they have done an experiment for the delhi metro 
where uh, when, when there was this Afghan earthquake, which was felt in Delhi, I think all the metro trains uh, could be stopped uh, just in time. So it was a trial basis. It was done and I think it was successfully uh, done, but we still need to progress in the field of early warning. We need to a lot more. Uh, I think that is one field where we are lacking uh, right now. So, uh, with this, I will conclude, but I must uh, also mention that tsunami warning because a lot of people are confused. All the tsunami is caused by earthquake. Tsunami warning actually is much easier because there you have a lot of time depending on the region, like an earthquake in Andaman or Sumatra. If it generates a tsunami, you have something like 2 to 3 hours time before the tsunami reaches the coast. So, tsunami warning is much easier actually compared to any of these uh, other things. And now we are also able to do flood warning. Like I presented in my last talk that uh, using seismic monitoring, it's possible even to track the floods and to give an early warning before the flood arrives at any point. So, uh, this is uh, what I would like to conclude as far as earthquake is concerned. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pulanchanda Rao. Very informative talk. What he says that it is very, very difficult to predict in, uh, in, uh, in advance, but a lot of works still that Indian leading institutes are doing and it is going on. So let me check, please, if any question is there or not. So far, no, no question is raised okay. by any of our participants. Yeah. So if at all okay. further yeah. it will come, I'll forward to you. Sure, and, sure, sure. Uh, yeah. After getting the answer, then I will mail to the concerned participants. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Actually, I also have to leave, so that that's fine. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. Thank nice you very answer. much. Uh, thank, thank you, Doctor Alder, for this opportunity. And uh, are, yeah. Oh, you are busy so much, but still, <laughs> keep yeah. your promise. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Adjustment, and thank you very much. Thank you so much. Now we we'll go Bye -bye. for the second lecture that is uh, with the Professor H. M. Dutta. So that is earthquake precursor detection in the Indian context. So, uh, <clears throat> Professor Dutta, he is a just one second. <clears throat> Prof Professor H. M. Dutta is a former principal scientist from CSR. National Physical Laboratory, New Delhi. Of course, he got retired quite some time back where he de uh, designed and developed various types of acoustic radars. So these radars give photograph in the air right from the surface of Earth to a height of one kilometer on continuous basis. So he established a chain of these radars in India Antarctica on board various ship, various ship and sailing over the Antarctic Ocean and even exported to other countries. Thrice he led to CSIR, National Physical Research Laboratory, NPL terms in Indian scientific expedition to Antarctica. He holds to his credit three science and technological contribution for the first time in history of mankind. With his vast Antarctic experience, Dr. Dutta led team for inducing acoustic radar as a technology for the detection of precursor of earthquake 24 hours in advance. And patent has been granted by the World Intellectual Property. Uh, property. And Dr. Dutta is currently uh, is only Indian who presented India's scientific and technological uh, might in the Republic Day Parade at Rajpath, New Delhi. He is the first in the world to design, develop, and run ship borne acoustic radar over the East Antarctic Ocean. He served as the founder director, REM Tech, Samli, and then served as a professor of electronics and communication engineering in Sami Vivekanand Subharti University, Mirat. Dr. Datta worked as an advisor of research and development in the Silver Line Prestige School, Ghaziabad, and presently he is senior advisor of Subram Technology Private Limited. 
New Delhi, a company dealing with the defense research and development. Dr. Datta has transferred acoustic radar technology to various companies in India and holds a copyright on the optical illumination laws, a new thought inducted for the first time in the history of mankind. Dr. Datta has supervised nine PhD theses on the atmospheric dynamics and has the book on Antarctica. His important contribution is the publication of book on Antarctica, the most interactive ice year ocean environment from Nova Science Publisher, USA. With this vast experience, Dr. Datta is elevating India as a top writer on Quora.com, where he answered 1900 questions, quite a vast, on subjects like Antarctica, earthquake, and atmospheric sciences, which have more than 16 lakh views. So he's having vast credentiality in his life and he's full he's having full in thousand still work on this field earthquake and radar also now with this i would request dr datta please take the stage and continue please continue his webinar dr datta please So you can load your PPT. Uh, good morning. Uh, is it visible, sir? It is visible very much. Okay. Please. And uh, voice is clear? Yes, it is clear, sir. Okay, okay. okay. That's fine. And just, just a minute, sir. Yeah. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, Honorable uh, Dr. Surya Prakash. Honorable Dr. Haldar, distinguished uh, members from various organizations and dear participants. While I speak on a very, very complex subject, earthquake precursor detection in the Indian, Indian context, let me confide that I, have I had absolutely nothing to do with seismology or earthquakes. I'm basically a designer of various types of acoustic radars. But one day what happened, and that's the story I'm going to narrate, that I detected the precursor of an earthquake and led India to have what is called an international patent from the highest intellectual authority in the world, the world WIPO, World Intellectual Property Organization. Just now, Professor Rao said, well, prediction is impossible. Prediction is impossible because, because there is no data. See, our whole knowledge about um, earthquakes, the data is available only, say, for the last 100 years. And in 100 years, at one particular point, to find the probability of occurrence of an earthquake to the level that will be acceptable to the masses is impossible. But then there is a hope we can find the precursor, Purvanu Bhas. I am having a feeling. See, many times you must have seen when you come out of your home or come out of your office, particularly because. Uh, uh, you know, what is called thunderstorms are in the evening, you feel as if there is some changes happening in the, in the what is called the atmosphere and uh, the clouds are there and there is a thunder. And then you say, oh, let us wait. Let us wait for some time because it is going to rain. 
99% of the time it rains. You had not predicted, but you felt, yes, there is going to be a, a rain and, and there is a rain. It's as simple as that. That means what we require, we require So, but before going, uh, let me say that I retired in 2007 and uh, I joined um, NPL in 1976. So I will divide my talk in three uh, units. What was my specialization before I took this patent? And now what are my vision, thoughts and recommendations? We have all seen an ultrasound. In ultrasound, the doctor is, uh, or, the, or the attendant or the, or the Doctor is, you know, moving this probe. Ultrasonic waves are transmitted inside the body, and these waves get reflected or scattered back, and that energy is picked up and is plotted in the form of a what is called a plot, which the for which the interpretation is given by a radiologist or uh, ultrasonic specialist. And uh, one is able to say, yes, there is a kidney, there is a stone, or whatever it is and uh, is able to even give detect the ailments. Exactly in the similar fashion, so this is an ultrasound of the body, we have an acoustic radar. I transmit a very powerful pulse into the atmosphere, pip. So this pip is about 140 dB. I mean, it is louder than your car horn, but is only for 50 milliseconds, okay? So when this sound goes into the atmosphere, my antenna is sitting on the ground, all around I build a shield so that I should not become a nuisance to others. And at the same time, I'm able to receive very, very feeble signals because I transmit about 100 watts of power and receive only 10 to the power minus 12 watt, minus 13, 14 watt. So it's a very feeble signal, but then through signal processing, we are able to get a photograph of air. So what I am doing, I am transmitting a pulse of 50 milliseconds. It goes into the atmosphere for three seconds because the sound velocity is about 340 meter per second. So it takes three seconds to go up and three seconds for the backscattered component to come to my antenna, where I pick up the signal, the scattered signal. So after every six seconds, I have to transmit a signal, pip, and then wait for, and, and immediately start receiving the signal. This technology I developed in 1976. And let me tell you, like in mobile, you see that uh, the first mobile and the mobile which you have received now, I'm sure there must have been 200 uh, different versions because it is not easy to keep the technology alive. Either the hardware will change or the software will change. So fortunately, I was in a position to keep the technology intact for over 31 years till I retired. And of course, it's a very promising field, as you will say. And if somebody is interested to work, I'll be the happiest person to help. Oh, sorry. So these are various types of acoustic radars that I had done, you see, because of the use, because it gives photographs of air. So naturally, I had established it on the, on, while went to, I went thrice to Antarctica and by ship. So I had established on board the ship and this is what we had established in Antarctica and I transferred its technology and I put uh, transfer uh, this technology to our the then Honorable Prime Minister, uh, President of India, uh, Shri Shankar Dayal Sharma Ji's son, he had a company and we had transferred our technology to that company as well. Of course, you need to have two systems, one working in Antarctica and one working in, in, in the in, in office, our own office, so that we are able to train the people. Because every year I cannot go, I will have to send people I was working as the convener for the whole CSIR Antarctic program 
and uh, had uh, deputed large number of people from various organizations and various universities or institutions. So, this is the instrument we had uh, placed in uh, Ramtech yeah. Ruti Engineering and Management it's Technology it's Institute, Shamli, in 2015. And uh, uh, these are for you know certain other specific purposes because of engineering students were there. But we will have to develop a new radar for our <laughs> This equipment, this when we had placed it in Antarctica, it was a huge instrument because everything was in duplicate. And uh, you know, at that time, our laptop was only a 286 or 486 based PC. Uh, uh, which now and nowadays, uh, thankfully, that uh, PCs are very, very, very fast, and uh, 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 and signal processing has taken over. So the instrument itself is there is nothing called instrument. The electronics is only five percent, and rest is all uh, uh, software. Now the question is this: What do we see when I say that? Okay, it gives me a photograph of air. This upper one is the photograph of air during the daytime. The, you can see the hot air parcel is going up and the cold air mass, the white portion is coming down. So here we transmit a pulse, you know, six seconds it takes to go up and come down. Then in the next line, third line, fourth line, fifth line. So over a period of about five minutes, I'm able to know what exactly is happening into the atmosphere. So this is a photograph of atmosphere and we have utilized these photographs because I installed these radars for about 30 places in India for environmental monitoring and for the clearance of the, what is called the uh, EIA, Environmental Impact Assessment Clearance for installing a particular uh, industry or a factory or something like that. So these were part of uh, what is called Ministry of uh, Environment where the clearances were being given. In the nighttime, you see the atmosphere is like sleeping. You have the stable atmosphere because the temp here is the temperature on the surface is much higher compared to the temperature above um, at, a, at an altitude. So the thermal energy is forcing the air to move up. The question is this, what do we see? After all, when we look at each other, we see only the reflectivity from the surface, from the face. And on the basis of that, our mind is able to reconstruct and uh, able to see, yes, he's a, he's a person, he's a, she's a girl or a boy or a clock or something like that, or a laptop, because this is what is called the pattern classification. So, but once the atmosphere is stable, it is not stable in the sense, there are so many wave motions are there, like a stable, uh, what is called ocean, if you throw or on a pond, if you throw a, a rock or a stone, you can see the ripples. But during daytime, because the churning is taking place, you cannot see uh, any movement of a, a wave motion in the in the lower atmosphere. Yeah, this is again the 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 layer is sitting on the top of, and since we are monitoring it on continuous basis, naturally. It is like a dog. You have trained a dog to identify your own, uh, what is called family members, and is uh, standing on your gate. As and when it sees a stranger, it starts barking. So not that you have you have predicted a, the, 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 the coming of a stranger at home, but since you have a watchdog watching the, uh, 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 the gate on 24 hour basis, so anything new will be recorded by this particular technology. So it is the fastest, cheapest, the most economical instrument all over the world for monitoring the lower atmosphere. Fortunately, the lower atmosphere is sitting right on the skin of the earth, on this earth surface. That means if there is something in the earth which happens, it must get amplified or transferred to the air. I mean, this is what we had expected. So you can see even the air bubbles, you can see thunderstorms, anything, uh, what is called land breeze, sea breeze, at what altitude uh, they, this is what is happening, how many gradients are there, 
and all those things. It's a it's a very simple technology, but then uh, you need to have the interpretation of the data that you recall. So I am since I was working with the electronics, I, I developed the whole system in 70, 76, and I was invited uh, by IIT Kanpur to deliver this lecture uh, by the Department of Aeronautical Engineering. And since then, I never looked back. Okay, the most happiest person because we had established, you can see the wind will, oh my goodness, anything that you can imagine uh, will be recorded, but it should not be less than five minutes because I cannot uh, just on the basis of single line say, yes, this is what is happening. You have to wait for and uh, 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 for a phenomenon to really uh, be apparently recorded uh, on the on the what is called our acoustic radar, uh, proximal data. You can see the gravity waves, the, the wave motions in the atmosphere, and these are very, very important uh, for transferring the energy. It is like, you know, you have thrown a stone in the in the in the in the what is called a lake. The energy travels from the point of source uh, uh, all around in the form of ripples and uh, the, the particles move vertically up and down and the energy flows in the in the, in the horizontal direction. So these are. With, I had that what is called uh, around, uh, uh, you know, the experience of developing, putting the things in the field. My goodness, you can see the what is called uh, the impact of uh, uh, moisture content uh, into the atmosphere, pressure differences into the atmosphere. What is going to happen? How the churning is taking place? What is happening to air because of various processes uh, that happen into the air? So with this like fog in air. I was invited uh, by, by so many, you know, uh, uh, for fog monitoring over northern India is very important. That sitting on the ground, I know that fog is about 800 meter thick and it has so many gradients in it. Okay, so you know that at what time the fog is going to dissipate, how the fog is forming, all those processes. And when I established myself in Antarctica, I had two experiences. One, the experience was because Antarctica is so cold, it is the best place to study gravity waves. It is the best place to study KH wave, different kinds of wave motions, because the atmosphere there is more stable. And I also experienced uh, several, what is called cyclones. My goodness, sitting in the ship, when a, your ship is caught in a cyclone, the, the way, uh, you know, the turbulent waves uh, make an impact. Uh, you hold your ears and pledge that next time I will not come. But then when you go reach in Antarctica, then uh, you forget that pain because ultimately pleasure and pain, uh, both are connected with each other. So as a developer of acoustic radar, over 30 sites in India and in Antarctica, and a person who had transferred its technology, and uh, I took this patent, on earthquake precursor in 2005. So, uh, what happened? How this I came across uh, 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 something? Let me explain to you. So, this was my background. I'm basically an atmospheric science scientist, a developer, an electronics engineer, and I had absolutely nothing to do with uh, what is called uh, 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 with, with the seismology or earthquake. In the year 1999. I was chosen to represent India's uh, SNT might, science and technological might in Antarctica. Until date, perhaps I'm the only one uh, to have this kind of uh, attainment or credential, whatever you may call. Then I was uh, honored by the then Lok Sabha speaker for my lifetime uh, uh, contributions in the field of Antarctica because I was the convener. I seriously heard the wind, the, the word uh, and earthquake on 26 January of Bhuj, uh, when Bhuj was struck by a deadly earthquake. After about a week, I went to Rajkot along with a, a team um, and, and realized that apart from urgent medical aid and injured uh, people, we need dignified disposal, a dead body disposal, search for people buried under debris. We need food, we need shelter, we need emotional help for living ones, living ones, medicines of all kinds of prevalent uh, diseases and conditions. Everybody was taking, you know, medicines for injury or and all that. Nobody thought what happens to those who are pregnant, 
nobody thought what happens to those who are having heart attack or something like that so um, infrastructure repair very important as professor rao said when landslides or the roads are blocked then what do you do and coordination everything missing to the extent it was needed i was 54 years of age and i knew that help was too little and untimely and therefore we need to be self reliant when i came back in the year 2002 we were having a system acoustic radar working at wapi it is about 300 km from bhuj and i found that there is a signature there is a large amplitude and the longest period wave in the atmosphere and that was on 25th january uh, the gentleman you know he had switched off uh, the system at 8 o'clock in the morning because next day was a holiday and when we received this i saw this data i thought that this could be a precursor so if this is a precursor then what do we do then i studied started studying okay i decided that okay let me send this paper to either nature or take a patent international patent because this means this technology can be used uh, uh, for detecting earthquake precursor because nobody had uh, in the literature uh, ever claimed so dear uh, participants if i had not seen the tears the grief the misery the anguish the expectations of the people you know during earthquake and in my own life i am having a very strange coincidence i am grateful to god for saving me narrowly from death several times so i knew the value of life and while sailing to antarctica i had seen oh, my goodness i have faced cyclones and uh, our work on what is called earth ocean atmospheric coupling and uh, um, and then also i wrote a uh, long uh, uh, these things uh, on the on the benefits of cyclone you know whenever there is a cyclone everybody will say killer cyclone killer cyclone are a cyclones are it is the cyclone which generated humans it is the cyclone which is so beneficial to various other components of nature and therefore let us stop calling a cyclone as a killer a cyclone you know uh, and my temperament to be innovative with all these things i looked at the nature once again see nature has created heterogeneity so that if there is any catastrophe in one the people are going to be saved in other uh, in other regions nature doesn't want to kill humans but there is a small energy imbalance e is equal to mc square and that we have to face because the whole world is the change is inevitable material is a temporary manifestation of energy the whole world the whole universe is changing we worry about earth as we live here since we live here that doesn't mean the change will not be there the moment change stops that will be the end of earth 50 years back everybody was interested to predict uh, a cyclone but now prediction is uh, is is a secondary because we know we have developed the technologies we have the what is called cyclone uh, uh, cyclones being mapped from the uh, from the uh, satellites as well as we have the radars the satellite is made how do we say we are not measuring cyclone a cyclone has a property that it shows in the form of clouds so in fact we are measuring clouds we are we are seeing the uh, infrared through infrared or optical images and we infer then yes there is going to be a cyclone now of course so in 1999 about 10000 people had died and now of course uh, um, um, thanks to ndrf and idm and all those organizations nobody is dying i mean if 10 people are dying they will die in any case so that is the kind of what is called a fault which will be required in earthquake also and i am uh, i'm sure so the role of technology in dark directing rescue rescue and relief it is it's it holds the key unless we develop technology unless we develop our instruments borrowing instruments uh, 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 buying instruments 
will not lead us anywhere because we don't calibrate our system. We don't, uh, uh, once we have purchased, we do not have the facility to calibrate. S sitting in NPL, I was issuing test and calibration certificates yearly for all the radars because changes will take place. Something is working in the, in, in the field. Uh, obviously it is bound to, uh, something is going to uh, happen to the system. Well, dead bodies. How do we handle dead bodies? It's a billion dollar business for, uh, for many countries. And unfortunately, as Professor Rao in the morning said, well, are we involved? Only handful people will work and rest. We, are, we work as an onlooker. And not only an onlooker, we don't allow even emergency vehicles to move. Because I want to see, even if one person removes one kg of, you know, part of the, uh, uh, this thing, because that training is not there. We, we, we feel as if it is the job of just 10 people who are working, who have come from various organizations and they are pouring their energy. No, we never think that it is our job. So mass burial, this is mass burial, I mean, at the national level. And just after two days, this is very important, the, what is called uh, the, the uh, uh, mass of, uh, water burial. Because in the coastal region, if suppose there are 5 lakh or 10 lakh people are going to die in a, in, a, in a fraction of a second, then what do you do? Are we prepared for that? So we have to change uh, our mindset in the, in the national interest. Thanks to seismologists. So a person as an atmospheric scientist, when I look at this, I know that, okay, here is the probability for next earthquake to come. And unfortunately or fortunately, the danger looms a lot as far as India is concerned. In nature, change is inevitable and earthquakes are part of nature's churning machine. Since, uh, uh, so very important because the probability of striking at a place is extremely low. And it is not possible to predict at the socially acceptable level. Socially acceptable level means I can say, okay, please be away from your building, sit in your park with your bread and butter for just six hours, 10 hours for a day. I cannot say that, okay, in October 2023, there is going to be an earthquake. Uh, in Delhi, nobody is going to stop the work and people will, so that's socially acceptable, okay? Therefore, earthquake precursor science and technology, which of course will require an integration of various mindset sets with a single aim. The aim should be, let us coordinate with each other, let us pour our energy and our focus is right now, to have an entire comparison, to have everything put together and, 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 and get the, uh, what is called the benefit for the society. If you look at our own, uh, what is called um, uh, 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 civilization, uh, Barha Mitra had, uh, you know, in uh, 505 AD, he had, uh, uh, he had very well, very well documented that what kind of earthquakes exist in our India. And uh, you know, Vayu type earthquake, violent shaking in mountains. Okay. And then Agni type volcano, resulting to this Indra type with cyclones and tornadoes and Varuna type tsunami. Now, what have we done since then? We have only given a new, new, new what is called uh, uh, terminology. And although people were living in just huts, they were not concerned about the death because of falling hut. They were concerned because of the changing wide scale patterns like the, 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 the river is going to change the, uh, or, or, or the mountains are going to fall to a level where they are going to uh, create a catastrophe. Uh, <laughs> so we, you, we have, uh, you question ourselves, have we made a sincerely uh, any progress? We have given new terminology, we have developed new uh, in instruments, that's it. If you see medical science, the problem here is in an earthquake, unless an earthquake comes, I will not be in a position to uh, diagnose. Since it is coming once in every, say, 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 10 years, so I will have to quietly sit and wait for that. Okay, and what happens in 10 years of time, your boss will say, you are not working, you are not doing anything here. Eh? Leave this field because they want 
we do not have patience in our system. If somebody says, I'm working in earthquake precursor, you will have to have patience. You will have to have what is called the faith. Yes, I am working sincerely, but I need an earthquake uh, to make the progress. If we look at the medical science, because so many patients are there, the rabies, doctor finds that, okay, if you are a choking, uh, 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 I mean, these are the symptoms. Okay, these are the symptoms. Um, so based on symptom, the doctor knows the problem. In kidney, he's not checking the kidney first. He's just seeing that your muscles are cramping. In cancer, malaria, all these things we have been in a position because, because there was a, uh, what is called, uh, sorry. Because, the, because the patients were there. So symptoms and the actual problem. Medical science is very nice. Yeah. In the case of earthquake, 8 lakh 30,000 people died in China. We, when we see all these figures, we think that these figures belong to some other nation. Ladies and gentlemen, these figures, any of these figures will work in even, will be seen in India in very, very close time because already these stresses have built to such an extent um, that, uh, um, I mean, uh, we will have to face. Now, even in man-made events like Russia-Ukraine war, we had a precursor because from the satellite images, people could see, yes, there is a buildup of army. There is a buildup of infrastructure uh, uh, you, uh, going to be used for war. And then uh, people had predicted. So this is these are precursory signatures, okay? You don't have to predict a war, but precursor is seen. Now comes the question, how much is the energy and what is earthquake? Why do we have to worry about earthquake? If you look at the energy in a very severe cyclone and earthquake, it is the same, exactly about 10 to the power 18 joules of energy. And in earthquake, in Japan, that uh, M is equal to nine, it was also the same. The issue is, um, <laughs> In the case of a uh, cyclone, the decay takes place over a over over five six days ten days. It builds up you know, in in about uh, five six days and it decays in five six days. So the energy release per second is extremely useful, and that is why I say that cyclones are useful for the uh, uh, for the benefit of uh, the human kind or the nature. But in the case of earthquake. The decay takes place when a, in a period of just a couple of minutes, two minutes, three minutes. So massive amount of energy getting released per second is important. It is not the total amount of energy. The total uh, heat that uh, the energy consumption in US uh, annual is, can, uh, is, is 100 times more than the energy in an earthquake. But then that energy consumption is slowly being consumed. It is like a nuclear power uh, power plant or a nuclear mom. Energy is same, but their energy is useful and here the energy is destructive. So it is the energy. So in nature, since earthquake releases the energy per second is the highest and therefore the destruction. But in nature, nature has given something very important because as I said, nature doesn't want to kill humans. Every large energy dissipation has a precursor in some form or the other. You cannot have so much of buildup of energy. It is not a slaughtering. It is not, nature is not interested to slaughter the people. Nature is interested uh, 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 to save the people. And therefore, uh, uh, see if, um, I mean, I will just skip these two slides. So I, what I did, I studied this, okay, earth is about 5,000 kg per meter cube. 5,500 kg per meter cube, and water is 1,000 kg per meter cube, and air is only 1.2 kg per meter cube. So I am 5,000 times lighter than the earth. So if earth one kg, uh, uh, if uh, so I am billion times, then to my total mass is 120 to the power 18, while earth has 10 to the power 24. So I am million times lighter. Since I am million times lighter, if I have to scratch a line, I have already scratched a line. 
But if I have to scratch a line on my table, it will require 5,000 times more of energy in order to make a scratch. And in solid, once you have made a scratch, it is permanently visible to us, our eyes. And we say, oh, there was, a, there was an earthquake. And because of that, this line or this fracture is there. In water, it will be 1,000 times, okay, less energy. That means if air is going, if earth is going to leak any energy, even if it is 1%, uh, 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 it will be a million percent change for me in, in, the, in, the, in the atmosphere. That was the basis for me to think, yes, there is, can be an earthquake precursor and I need to calculate. So based on that, I studied thoroughly about the seismology and earth atmospheric coupling and communicated that paper, paper to nature. When I communicated that paper to nature, nature asked me three questions. I could solve only two questions. I could not solve three or third question, which I had written to about 50 organizations and nobody uh, came forward to support. But I still, I can share that and uh, you can publish a paper. So earthquake, you can see the, 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 the impact in the atmosphere if it is, in, because earth, otherwise air is not visible. But on my instrument, it is visible. See, look at this. You are able to see a cyclone because it is water vapor is associated. Clouds are associated. You are able to see tsunami because uh, because physically you can see and the pressure uh, difference is there. It moves uh, at, a, at a much slower rate uh, compared to what happens in air. So these are all the lith lithosphere atmosphere relationship couplings are there and uh, uh, wonderful that how much energy is is released and how much is going to be the change. This is what, since you are, you are just throwing a bubble or a, or, a, or, a, or a stone or a rock, you can see number of uh, uh, what is called uh, waves being created and you know the energy. And similarly, exactly in the similar fashion are the waves traveling in atmosphere. And uh, so if you look at the atmosphere, nature has gifted atmosphere um, uh, just uh, not for the sake of just breathing. I am sure it was such a massive system of 10 to the power 24 kg, having such a light system of 10 to the power just 18 kg, million times lighter, must be, uh, must be, must have been created in order to see whether there is a momentum transfer, energy transfer in terms of electromagnetic waves or infrared or a mass transfer, water vapor, gases, charged particles, and particles coming out, and they are they get amplified. As Dr. Rao in the morning showed you the TEC being uh, uh, measured, I also published a paper very, very initially, and we published in International General Remote Sensing uh, uh, about the TEC. But as you go away from the, uh, uh, from the surface, the, uh, the, the errors will increase. And fortunately, I sit right on the surface, okay? And then there are three changes in the three components of the magnetic field and gravity field. They hold the important key. The, 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 and then these are the systems which we need to see. The basic uh, uh, problem which seismologists had made in classical thinking, because seismologists thought that, okay, because it is an earthquake, so its precursor must be sitting in earth. That is wrong. The, the precursor is sitting in air. The precursor is sitting in the energy. You don't have to look at the earth in order to know the precursor. That was the, uh, I mean, all these uh, uh, thoughts came to my mind as a layman, as a person who had never studied uh, what is called earthquake. And I was uh, 55 year old. I had decided that, okay, let me file a patent. Okay, because India had no patent in the field of earthquake precursor. So with all that thing, when we submitted this, there were 40 questions officially, and my goodness, people write to you so bluntly, unofficially through your own personal email. I replied to every question. And then it was in 2005 that uh, the patent was granted. So three, four years of my life, I had like a mad dog, I worked to get that patent. 
because uh, you have to first deal with your lawyer, you have to deal with your what is called planning and monitoring agencies, this and that. Uh, uh, you know, when you are working for the first time, you have to face so blunt uh, questions, comments, and all that. Have patience, work on scientific lines, and be bold. I'm sure the the the, the nature was great. No one needs science and technology after earthquake. Science and technology must find a precursor and play a vital role because then you need to, you will stop medical emergency, death, destruction, you, nobody can stop, but you can stop death, you can stop dignified disposal of dead body. You don't have to worry about the dead bodies like this is what is happening now in, in cyclones and ERF and NIDM teams, you know, they are able to um, handle um, so well. But you require then as a food and water supply, blood donation, you, know, you will not require. There will not be an outbreak of any diseases. You don't have to go for emotional rescue. This is a very important aspect which we never touched. The woman force has to be have to be uh, has to be there in order to give you emotional rescue. Don't worry. If your father has died, I'm your father. If somebody has died, I'm your mother. We will take care of you. So, ladies and gentlemen large number of observable techniques are there which we need to try which we must put them in an integral part as an integrated part lidar light detection and ranging immediately the moment you know aerosol saying concentration will increase from the surface you are sure yes this is because of the earthquake uh, precursor so you have an acoustic radar you have radiometers so radar eventually it will be the rar dar acoustic radar and satellite they are going to be the uh, rule the world as far as earthquake uh, uh, precursors are concerned there is a company called quack finder oh my goodness they are working in 40 countries just monitoring you know three components of the magnetic field um, i am in touch with this company the gentleman dr uh, 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 the, the the main principal scientist uh, um, i am working with them Okay, um, see, they are, uh, they are work of California based. The kind of money that gets invested, and uh, they, they are working in 40 countries because we do not have an earthquake in India. That doesn't mean earthquakes are not elsewhere. So we have to go there in order to get the experience. It is not a problem of India, it is the problem of the whole world. And to protect yourself, you don't have to go anywhere. Like in the case of cyclone, you have to shift all the people, you know, deep um, uh, in the interior of the, you have to just sit in the parks. You have to sit away from the infrastructures uh, because earthquake, if a big earthquake is going to strike, uh, please believe because of our infrastructure, tall infrastructure, tall buildings, uh, and uh, our density of uh, what is called the population is going to be a real disaster. Are we prepared for that? God only knows. So right now, earthquake precursor detection is an international issue, and I would love to suggest, uh, uh, specifically, I am addressing the young uh, participants, um, um, their um, kids. You see, what is the difference between you and me? I have the experience, and you have the energy. Let us couple it. So I would love to suggest a number of international problems on this subject by taking an international patent. I know, uh, I know there are more number of questions to be answered and uh, but let me tell you all that uh, phd or if you are interested to start your own industry in this area uh, i'll be able to help uh, and uh, and your problems will be well acceptable globally and we have to save what is called save humanity before earthquake strikes that would be our motive so disasters unite people if there are, there are no disasters we will never be together like look look at ukraine they're together because, because there is a disaster, there is need. So disasters unite people to develop mitigation strategies and technologies, and NIDM and NDRF are the outcome. Since earthquake poses the highest level of threat, we need to be united and pour the highest zeal in saving humanity. I personally feel that while handling, because this is what I experienced, there should be different types of teams handling dead bodies. Because dead body, is uh, will go in a different uh, has to be handled it's a last priority to be handled as per emergent policy of the nation 
injured, they need to be carried to the hospital. You have to find, buy, find people buried in, and then emotional rescue, life support system, and road clearance is very important. So, in NIDM, I could see that you have written to make India, you know, towards uh, making India disaster free. Let us change it. It can never be disaster free. We are challenging God, we are challenging nature. Disaster free cannot be there. We can minimize. Okay, we can minimize the impact because it is equal to MC square, Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesh. So change is inevitable. Ultimately, the earth will decay, earth will die one day. Okay, so please uh, uh, change it. And then I strongly recommend the following, that for mass deaths due to any natural disaster, all dead bodies should be disposed of as per national disaster policy to be implemented as per geographical location and resources. Somebody has died along the coast. The best is the sea barrier, which we do not have. We have never accepted it. Please change it. This is the need. See, once you are dead in a disaster, then we look at the government. Then government has to frame a rule. Okay, yeah, I was going to work in a country and I wrote to them that if I die uh, while working in earthquake precursion in your country, my body should be disposed of as per the uh, rules of the uh, of the society over there. I cannot isolate that. Okay, I'm from India and I must be buried uh, as per my, uh, my, my religion. No, the religion doesn't come. It comes the nation where you are working. All along Himalaya, all the students must be trained in one, at least one disaster management activity. Very important. India has dedicated scientists and engineers and working institutions. They need to be given liberal funding. Um, I'm sorry, the funding itself is an idea must focus on biological earthquake precursor. The kind of respect I have developed for, for our reptiles, my goodness, I'll just explain to you. A promising field due to digital, digital India. You have to just put a tag you have to put them in China has started a laboratory for, you know, reptiles and um, my goodness, they are the best biological precursors. We must develop and maintain, um, uh, develop technologies, okay? And technology so that we know, uh, we, we are able to repair, we are able to find, calibrate them. We know, we visualize the data uh, because it is, it, it is for the useful, usefulness of the humanity. And these instruments must be deployed not only in seismic, uh, 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 what is called active zones in India, we can, uh, we must put them even abroad and collaborate with private companies uh, abroad for joint, uh, what is called observation. We have been, you know, wasting 3000 crores or rupees per day in farmers education, continued for one hour, continued for one year. But uh, do we have the money for earthquake precursor research? If HM Datta will ask 10 crores, Oh my goodness, 10 eyes will be there. And people will desire the result outcome. As I said, there is no patience. People will say, okay, you are fine. What is the objective? What is the, how much, what are the milestones? My goodness, you don't believe your own scientists. You don't believe your engineers. And give them freedom. That's very important if we have to work seriously. So these are some of the publications uh, which uh, uh, we did uh, in International Journal of Remote Sensing, and this is the uh, these are the details of the um, uh, what is called uh, patent that we have taken. And uh, with these words, let me thank uh, NIDM and NDRF. Uh, great job indeed you are doing. I'm very happy that you are in uh, Delhi, and uh, since I'm from Delhi, I must thank you all. Thanks to all the participants and uh, distinguished. Uh, uh, members, my goodness, the kind of uh, respect after taking, uh, you know, what is called uh, the earthquake precursor uh, patent, the kind of respect I have developed for King Cobra. Oh, wonderful, wonderful instrument. It doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't require ACDC. It, it can eat both vegetarian, non-vegetarian, lives for years together. And it climbs onto the trees in order to minimize the electrical potential near the surface of the earth. It is, it has got no ears, so it is seismically active. The wonderful instrument which nature has gifted us, and I'm sure 
uh, our, our Rishi Munis. And that is why we respect them. That is why we worship them. So with these words, let me thank you all. And thanks, Dr. Haldar, for giving me an opportunity to express myself. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank, thanks a lot, Dr. Datto. You have given <clears throat> excellent talk on this precursor of earthquake. Throughout life, what you have done, especially on the radar activity in Antarctica, in the odd climate, what experience you have, especially, and you rightly said that is the go, uh, very uh, best place for absorbing or for getting all types of waves. And from there, you have started, and before that, also, you have started your journey and how the this uh, precursor, especially you uh, rightly told, this is the integrated things and it needs patient to work out for the precursor. Now, I thanks you very much. Now with us, our professor Ramesh uh, Singh is with us. So he wants to uh, put his uh, certain views on this. So I welcome Dr. Uh, professor uh, Singh in this context. Now we are handling the stage. You can continue what you would like to add or what you would like to compliment further. Uh, thank you, Dr. Haldar, Dr. Surya Prakash, Dr. Uh, Datta. Uh, Namaskar. Namaskar. <laughs> so I hope you remember me. Okay. <laughs> Sir, I have not done this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. You. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, you you presented very uh, your uh, gravity waves, and also congratulate you for the uh, patent. I remember 20 years back, um, Doctor Dutta was very much excited uh, with this observation, what he did. And uh, of course, the uh, earthquake is very complex uh, yeah. phenomena and we make it uh, complex. And uh, I'm also working uh, since uh, so many years and whatever uh, Dr. Dutta experienced that uh, he submitted a paper in Nature and things like that. Um, the Bhuj earthquake is a very studied earthquake. Okay, we did a lot of work. And I, I know since the last uh, three decades, they, in the name of the earthquake, uh, people, they fight, they quarrel. Okay, and everybody would like to claim that uh, I get a success in the earthquake prediction, the precursory studies. And even our former president, Abdul Kalam, was very much excited, okay? The world has spent millions and billions of dollars. I'm sitting in the U.S. In the name of earthquake precursor, I cannot get a penny. And the, when the Bhuj earthquake occurred, there are so many parameters we observed. And whatever the, like uh, Dutta said, the, he got a patent. I also got a patent the, on the surface latent heat flux. And it, I also submitted a paper in Nature, and the Nature asked the same question, the, what the, Dutta the, he, he got. And I, I hired the 15 students in my lab at the at the Indian Institute of Technology Kanpur and it and it, I did not get the answer to the questions raised by nature people and the after that I came to US one of the students say he did a PhD and the people the people they are working on the and I would not like to based on the, my experience of 30 years, I would not like to ask young students to do precursory studies. When I was doing my master's, since then the, I know that people, they are so excited that they, there will be an earthquake in Assam and they were doing a lot of measurements, but we did not get it, okay. 
And I know in the country there are the multi parameters observatory. One is in Assam, one is the uh, good the somewhere in the Himachal Pradesh, one is in Gujarat. Okay, they are recording so many parameters. Okay, so th this is a really very complex and it. Uh, people like Datta, if it, they do research, find, okay, I also published a series of papers related with the earthquake, related with the uh, multi parameters. And uh, uh, like in NIDM, I gave a call, uh, talk on the coupling, the coupling between the land, ocean, atmosphere, ionospheric coupling, okay, associated with the, all kinds of natural hazards, okay. So I'm a bureau member of the electromagnetic EM induction, okay? And, it, and we always, we are trying to say, I, what I hate people, that they, based on the one parameter, they can say that, oh, I can predict the earthquake. Earthquake is a very, very complex, okay, parameter. And it, we should not go to the press or to any media. I know that the, there were people, they, they went to the, the, the television and they say, oh, tomorrow at eight o'clock, there will be earthquake in India. And they were behind the bar in India, you see, because there was no earthquake. So precursory studies, they, of course, it, People uh, should you study, and uh, whatever they are, like uh, Puran Chand uh, Rao, he said they uh, about the animal behavior, uh, other thing, and uh, I also got uh, ex uh, very much excited. I put uh, eight rats in the in the biology lab <laughs> because the earthquake occur in uh, California. And then I found that they, even the rats started cheating us. Okay. <laughs> and then there were so many people, they published the papers and the animal behavior. And the, I started saying, no, we should not do that. Okay. So there are people, they, they, they try to do it. And whatever they, Dr. Datta, you said they, Quick, um, um, what is it? They are my good friends. Okay, and they, nothing is happening. They are really they don't have money to do anything. Okay, so the, the I, I will discourage the young people to do this. And whatever the Puran Chandra also said that they, there is the P wave, S wave on the basis of the P and S wave. DST is supporting in, uh, some of the proposal and a California event, the, the, uh, the Stanford the colleagues, they have developed the alert system. So that may work. The ionospheric TEC signals, they show the promising results. There are people working. So we should, without money, if we can do that, then fine. Okay. But uh, I would not like to, to encourage young people to, to do that because the earthquake is very, very complex. Okay. So, the, the, uh, so these are the stories. And Bhuj earthquake is well studied. Okay, and yeah. even in the Bhuj 2001 and 2003, I had organized the uh, conference in which it, I invited Datta, and the Datta said, no, I do not want to, I, I, I want that you should not publish my abstract because they were, he was going for patent. In the patent, if you present that to your work, you may not get the patent, okay. So I would like to say that this is a very complex and the interesting problems of the precursory studies, okay? And one should try to uh, become earth doctor. And here in US, if you go to the doctor, they, they will not prescribe any medicine. 
unless they would like to see the blood yeah. test, the urine test, yeah. the sugar level, and oh, other yeah. things. So <laughs> let's become a good doctor. Okay, yeah. after doctor, yeah. and I try to try to uh, try to monitor all the parameters, integrate yeah. this. Okay, and uh, I'm running uh, the journal. The, I'm a, the associate editor of the International Journal of Remote Sensing. I'm in the Geometric Natural Hazards and Risk Journal, which is the 12th 12, 12 years, okay? And uh, there are so many papers, uh, people they submit, and we return that because we would like to integrate this, okay? okay. So the earthquake precursory studies is very, very complex, okay? And it, let us not ask money. We should try to do. There are so much data that are available. Okay, yeah. we we should make an effort. And even the water level is giving good signals. Okay, so the, there are many many parameters. We should try to uh, integrate this. So I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you, Doctor Datta. Okay. No, no, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> As a, uh, unless we have a uh, what is called uh, what is called uh, uh, a diversified brain, diversified views, the progress cannot I, be. I I completely agree. I completely agree. And we have spent a lot of money. DST has spent a lot of money. And a Birbal Singh he put the antennas in the Agra. Okay, ground measurements and other measurements. Okay. So the, yeah. these are the lot of problems here. See, the, so the the young younger lot, uh, like I would not like to encourage. Okay, <laughs> and there are so many observatories. We have multi parameters observatories are operational. Okay, since the last five to ten years, why not? We should try to analyze this, build up the statistics. Okay. Uh, to do that, okay. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Alder, for giving me ch chance to okay. express my views. Okay, thank okay. you. Uh, look, okay, uh, we have noted your observation and the great views. Of course, he told what are the uh, demerits and merits of that. It is a, it needs integration, and vast data is available with us, and it should be analyzed. But of course, he has uh, praised the professor, uh, Dr. Dr.'s patent that he has gone ahead and that is the good work what he has done for the india and that he has praised but of course we have to keep in mind the precursory is very very risk thing and we have to put a lot of I mean, patience and further a lot of time and a lot of work it needs now with this i have seen that professor Dotto, uh, if any question is there let me see just once more Okay, Dr. Sir, so far I could not find any question. Everybody has praised for your work and what oh, you have you. done for India. That is there. If at all anything will come, I'll I'll let me uh, let me know you, and uh, it will be vis a vis after obtaining the answer from you. I'll post the things to the concerned participants yeah, in yeah, the mail. Yeah, yeah. So I should appreciate that you have done excellent work for the patent you are work. No, sir. And I mean, should the question is this. Yeah. So unless yeah. that, uh, yeah. See, the, when you are fighting a war at the global level, you also understand how do the how do uh, the human mindsets, uh, you know, they react. Yes. Okay. Yes. And that's yes, very important. Yeah. You see, it, um, it, it teaches you a lot, and then you find that there are a n number of unanswered questions uh, which need to be solved, uh, because ultimately the the mobile yes. which we have today in our hands, it is an obsolete. Within six months, there is another version. So we need to have, Sir, you know, the changes. <laughs> we should congratulate. You see, it in uh, India, a lot of persons are there. It is a, a 130 crore or even more. Yeah. Now you cannot answer each and every person or that. Yeah. But of course, it is flourishing. Your patent, I should appreciate for that. And uh, Nassim knows that what is your contribution for the 
precursory and I should appreciate for that. And obviously, you have given an excellent time. Precisely, you have explained your work that I should thanks for that. Now, you, with, this, with this, I'll put again thanks to you. Now, as a customary, I have to put my vote of thanks in this session. Now, I <clears throat> in this uh, forum that our executive director, uh, IPS, Mr. Taj Hassan, he has having he had put his great support to each and every individual speaker and also our these faculties to conduct this type of webinar and training and it should make the public for awareness for the preparation mitigation and what are the uh, what are the things for forecast there he has used to support all the times now our next who is our uh, head professor surya pukas he is always there to make the program in success and to support even he is busy all the times for different programs in a day randomly programs are there from beginning to evening but still he want to put his time for uh, to put support each and every faculties so, so for that he has supported us also and in last in past also it is there so i put my heartfelt thanks to professor surya prakash next all the, uh, the both the speaker that is dr h n datta he is a quite senior man and he is working in this antarctica of course he is not professional seismologist but still he is uh, having lot of knowledge and lot of things you want to do in seismology also so this precursory also it is a good effort he has done i put my sincere thanks to dr datta next is dr p c rao puran chandra rao he has given a very uh, knowledgeable uh, i mean that uh, description and lecture to for the participant and for the faculties also he has uh, put his views for seismic zonation micro zonation in jabalpur area and other area and he also told a lot of animal behavior for that in precursor also and he has he told that it is, it is a it is an integrated thing for the precursor work, uh, work of earth, uh, earthquake now i put my sincere thanks to professor uh, to dr uh, uh, puran chandra rao now next is the our faculties who has joined and dr uh, professor ramesh singh he has critically analyzed the seismic activity quite long time in india and abroad he he had his views this gujarat uh, bhuj earthquake and and other parts of earthquake so he has critically analyzed still he is having views for future also and i put my big thanks to professor singh he has taken an interest to hear our this session and and he placed his observation and uh, comments uh, and i i put my thanks big thanks to him now the all the learned speaker uh, participants who are with us with the morning still in full swing there us so they have learned and within that some professor also they are they have put their their comments is a very good things from the speaker they could hear and also and he has given he told the nidm is organizing uh, nice uh, themes and nice a very efficient speaker in the in the particular or the relevant topic so they have shown their gratefulness for this now i put my heartfelt thanks to all the participants who are joined and who has seen who has observed the speaker's address and our this uh, this uh, professor ramesh singh earlier he has also given lecture on that so i put my very very heartfelt thanks to all the participants now that uh, it team of nidm so they are behind us to support to make the program successful i put my thanks to them now with this i'll put my words now again we'll see in future a big thanks to all who has i cannot uh, remember right now but who have supported this program i put my thanks to them okay thank you very much to all now i will put leave from right now okay